pleasure to welcome the, our next uh, players of the next event. Uh, it's, uh, Stephanie Dick, who is here, is, has, in addition to her great contributions in history of science and mathematics in particular, uh, where she's writing on the history of automated proof and the debates that that precipitated about what a proof was and whether machines could do it. Uh, she's also had a very long-standing interest in theater and has written a series of performance plays. Um, the last one, which everyone found absolutely delightful, was on the Turing test, where she animated the exchanges between computers and people and the attempt to make a device that could respond to our provocations by keyboard in a way that would be indistinguishable from a person at the other end, Turing's great challenge to machine intelligence. Um, but she has, for this occasion, with the uh, able and great assistance of the graduate students from the uh, ART Advanced Theater Program, uh, put together a, 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 a play, a play reading, that uh, they will perform for you. So uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Stephanie Dick. Hi, thanks a lot everybody for coming and I want to say like Peter, I work in the modern period and it's been an absolute pleasure for me to listen to all of the wonderful talks bringing us back to 400 years ago to such a rich time in the history of astronomy, so thank you so much. Uh, many of the speakers today have alluded to the fact, and I'm sure everyone in this room knows, there has been a very long-standing and complicated relationship between uh, the astronomy and science of the period often known as the scientific revolution and art, music, painting, and Peter and I thought it might be a nice addition to the conference today to bring some of those other voices into the room. So what you're about to see is a theatrical piece that's quite experimental that weaves together scenes from the very famous 1940s play written by Bertolt Brecht, The Life of Galileo, uh, woven together with poetry from the early modern period, some of the letters that were exchanged between Galileo and Mark Welzer, uh, and certain other pieces that relate to the blemishing of the sun and the novel astronomy uh, for which Galileo is so well known. Uh, so it is absolutely a pleasure to introduce the five actors from the ART. We're so lucky to have them as a part of the Harvard community. Uh, they're always such a pleasure to work with. They're so talented. I'd also like to thank Julia Smiliansky, who makes the collaborations we've done with them uh, this time and in the past possible. She's wonderful. Uh, they're wonderful. I very much hope that you enjoy this show. Thank you. Part one, bodies in motion. Walls and spheres and immobility. For 2,000 years, people have believed that the sun and all the stars in heaven rotated around mankind. Pope, cardinals, princes, professors, captains, merchants, fishwives, and even school kids thought they were sitting motionless inside a crystal sphere. But we are breaking out of it at full speed because the old days are over and that this is a new time. For at least a hundred years, mankind has seemed to be expecting something. Our cities are cramped, and so are men's minds, superstition, and the plague. But now the word is, that's how things are, but they are, won't, won't stay like that, because everything is in motion. Behold the world, and how it is whirled around, and for it is so whirled, is named so. In whose, in whose large volume many rules are found of this new art, which it doth fairly show. For your quick eyes in wandering to and fro from east to west on no one thing can glance. But if you mark it well, it seems to dance. First, you see fixed in this huge mirror blue of trembling lights a number, numberless. Fixed, they are named, but with a name untrue, for they all move. And in a dance express that great long year that doth contain no less than three score hundreds of those years in all, which the sun makes with his course natural. What if to you these sparks disordered seem as if by chance they had been scattered there? The gods a solemn measure do a deem and see a just proportion everywhere, and know the points whence first their movings were, to which first points when all return again, the axle tree of heaven shall break in twain. Under that spangled sky by wandering flanks, besides the king of day and queen of night, 
are wheeled around all in their sundry frames, and all in sundry measures do delight. Yet all together keep no measure right, for by itself each doth itself advance, and by itself each doth a galliard dance. I like to think it began with the ships. As far as men could remember, they had always hugged the coast. Then suddenly they abandoned the coastline and ventured out across the seas. On our old continent, a rumor sprang up. There might be new ones. And since our ships began sailing to them, the laughing continents got the message. The great ocean they fear is a little puddle. Ye southern, stormy, and deserted seas, where scarce a vessel tries the uncertain breeze, far from his home my wandering brother braves your hidden rocks and unfrequented waves, and dares unmoved your lonely depths explore where never human voice was heard before. Ye sons of Europe, to whose gaze t'was given first to behold another starry heaven, on you that knowledge dawned, whose radiance shined with noontide luster in philosophers' minds. No more ye deemed the world's discovered round a level plain by skies enclosing bound, but saw it balanced on its orbit roll, its erring course attractive laws control, viewed other planets mid the realms of space, and due progression keep their destined place with central suns that gave their circling spheres the stated seasons of returning years. The navigation's daring tap could show where sea sun triumph around the isles unnoticed flow. Then science shared her praise and boldly broke airs and feebling spells, and deadening yoke starting to life in superstition's trance. Or opening nature shot her vigorous lens, and now enlarged, her secret loss explores with eagle ken mid solar system source, see stars unnamed that have for ages thrown their fires neglected over sky unknown. And a vast desire has sprung up to know the reasons for everything. Why a stone falls when you drop it, and why it rises up when you toss it up. Each day something fresh is discovered. Men of a hundred even are getting the young to bawl the latest example into their ear. There have been a lot of discoveries, but there is still plenty to be found out. So future generations should have enough to do. Soon humanity is going to understand its abode, the heavenly body on which it dwells. What is written in the old books is no longer good enough. For, there, for where faith has been enthroned for a thousand years, doubt now sits. Everyone says, right, that's what it says in the books. But let's have a look for ourselves. Keep your eyes glued on the telescope, my friends. What you are seeing is the fact that there is no difference between heaven and earth. Today is the 10th of January, 1610. Today mankind can write in its diary, got rid of heaven. A new philosophy calls all in doubt. The element of fire is quite put out. The sun is lost, and the earth and no man's wit can well direct him where to look for it. And freely men confess that this world is spent, when in the planets and the firmament they seek so many new, they see that this is crumbled out again to his atomies. Tis all in pieces, all coherence gone, and just supply and all relation. Prince, subject, father, son, are things forgot. For every man alone thinks he hath got to be a phoenix, and that then can be None of that kind of which he is, but he. His Highness, the Grand Duke Cosimo de' Medici. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> As your Highness no doubt realizes, we astronomers have been running into great difficulties in our calculations for some while. We have been using a very ancient system, which is apparently consistent with our philosophy, but not, alas, with the facts. Under this ancient Ptolemaic system, the motions of the stars are presumed to be extremely complex. But even if we accept the awkwardness of such motions, we are still unable to predict the positions of the stars accurately. We do not find them where in principle they ought to be. What is more, some stars perform motions which the Ptolemaic system just cannot explain. Such motions, it seems to me, are performed by the small stars which I have recently discovered around the planet Jupiter. Would you gentlemen, Care to start by observing these satellites of Jupiter, the Medicean stars? Kindly sit here. Oh, thank you, my good ma'am. I fear things are not quite so simple. Mr. Galilei, before turning to your 
famous tube, I wonder if we might have the pleasure of a disputation. It's subject to be, can such planets exist? A formal dispute. I was hoping you could just look through the telescope and convince yourselves. Please, this way. Of course, of course. I take it you are familiar with the opinion of the ancients that there can be no stars which turn round centers other than the Earth, nor any which lack support in the sky. I am. Moreover, quite apart from the very possibility of such stars, which our mathematicians would appear to doubt, I would like in all humility to pose a philosophical question. Are such stars necessary? Aristoteles in the Should lesson. we go on using the vernacular? My colleague, Mr. Federzoni, doesn't understand Latin. Does it matter if he understands this or not? Yes. Well, I am so sorry. I thought he was your lens grinder. Mr. Federzoni is a lens grinder and a scholar. Well, if Mr. Federzoni insists. I insist. The argument will be less brilliant, but it is your house. The universe of the divine Aristotle, with its mystical music of its spheres and its crystal vaults, the orbits of its heavenly bodies, the slanting angle of the sun's course, the secrets of the moon tables, the starry richness cataloged in the southern hemisphere, and the transparent structure of the celestial globe add up to an edifice of such exquisite proportions that we should think twice before disrupting its harmony. How about you gentlemen? Take a look at his impossible and unnecessary stars through this telescope. One might be tempted to answer that if you are to show something which cannot be there. It cannot be an entirely reliable tube, wouldn't you say? What do you mean by that? It would rather be more appropriate, Mr. Galileo, if you were to name your reasons for assuming that there could be free-floating stars moving about in the highest sphere of the unalterable heavens. Your reasons, Mr. Galileo, your reasons. My reasons, when a single glance at the stars themselves and my own notes make this evident pheno evident phenomenon evident? Sir, your disputation is becoming absurd. If one could be sure of not over-exciting you, <laughs> One might say what is in your tube and what is in the skies is not necessarily the same thing. Well, that couldn't have been more courteously put. Are you saying I'm a fraud? They think we painted the, painted the Medici stars on the lens. Not in His Highness's presence. Your instrument, I don't know whether to call it your brainchild or your adopted brainchild, since some like it existed in advance of your work, is most ingeniously made, no doubt of that. And we are utterly convinced, Mr. Galileo, that neither you nor anyone else would below bestow the illustrious name of our ruling family on stars whose existence is not above all doubt. No, no, no. Is there something the matter with my stars? There is nothing the matter with your highness's stars. This just that we're wondering if they are really and truly there. Well, are you gentlemen going to take a look or not? Of course, of course. Of course, but let's not beat around the bush. Sooner or later, Mr. Galilei will have to reconcile himself to the facts. Those Jupiter satellites of his would penetrate the crystal spheres. It's as simple as that. But, but you'll be surprised. The crystal spheres don't exist. Any textbook will tell you that they do, my good man. Right, then let's have new textbooks. Your Highness, my distinguished colleague and I are supported by none less than the divine Aristotle himself. The, the fellow had no telescope. Gentlemen, to believe in the authority of Aristotle is one thing. Tangible facts, another. You're saying that according to Aristotle, there are crystal spheres up there, so certain motions just cannot take place because the stars would penetrate them. But suppose those motions could be established. Mightn't that suggest to you that the crystal spheres don't exist? Gentlemen, in all humility, I ask you to go by the evidence of your own eyes. Your Highness, now, at night nowadays, telescopes are being pointed to the sky all over Italy, very much like our mariners, who a hundred years ago abandoned the coast without knowing what other coast they would encounter, if any. I believe in reason's gentle tyranny over people. Sooner or later, they will have to give in to it. Nobody can go on indefinitely, watching me drop a pebble and then saying it doesn't fall. No human being is capable of that. The lore of a proof is too great. Nearly everyone succumbs to it. Sooner or later, we all do. Thinking is one of the chief pleasures of the human race. Have to make sense. 
meant to be disbelieved, all right? That uh -huh. Satan exists. <laughs> Satan exists. That's something they doubt. <laughs> <laughs> but that the earth spins round in the gutter like a marble, that, that's believed, all right? Now, Sanctus and we can Oh, oh I, I'm getting giddy. But the earth's spinning round too fast. Oh, permit me to hold on to you, Professor. Yes, the old girl has been on the bottle again. <laughs> I said stop! We're skidding off! Oh, me, this is all a skew! I can only see what happened for backside! Help! As long as we're not flung onto the moon, it has very sharp peaks, I'm told, my brethren. What's this mean to lead to? Give him half a chance and they'll smash up our whole sky! Oh. Dig your heels in and sit! And don't look down, or I'm losing my balance! Some years ago, I discovered in our heavens many things that had not been seen before our own age. The novelty of these things and their consequences are in contradiction to the beliefs commonly held among philosophers and theologians. These discoveries have stirred up against me no small number of critics, as if I had placed these things in the sky with my own hands in order to upset and overturn the nature of things. In spite of their stubborn and malicious resistance, I hold the sun to be situated motionless in the center, while the earth and the other planets revolve around it. And the sun has shown itself unwilling to stand alone in innovating the confirmation of so an important conclusion. Instead, it wants to be the greatest witness of all of this, beyond exception. I have a new theory, a wonderful knot, difficult to untie, that forces the human intellect to admit the earth's annual revolution. So now hear this new and mighty marvel. There are spots on the sun. Part two, the solar spots. The sun too, both in rising and in withdrawing beneath the waves signs. The sun commands most certain signs, both those he brings at break of day and when the stars are rising. If hiding in a cloud he wears his morning guise flecked, and the center of his disc concave, beware of showers. The south wind from the deep driving bolds ill for trees and crops and herds. This too, still more will it pay you to remember. When, having spanned Olympus, he's departing, often we see colors of varying hue wander across his face. Purple means rain. Flame color means east winds. But if the flecks begin to take a tinge of fiery red, then will you see a welter everywhere of winds and storm clouds both. Who dares call the sun a liar? Most illustrious and excellent sir, Galileo Galilei. Already the minds of men are sailing the heavens and gain strength with every acquisition. You have led in scaling the walls and have brought back the awarded crown. Now others follow your lead with the greater courage, knowing that you, once you, have broken ice for them. It would indeed be base not to press so happy and honorable an undertaking. See then of what has arrived from a friend of mine. And if it does not come to you as anything really new, as I suppose, nevertheless, I hope you will be pleased to see that on this side of the mountains also men are not lacking who travel in your footsteps. With respect to these solar spots, please do me the favor of telling me frankly your opinion, whether you judge them to be made of starry matter or not, whether you believe them to be situated or what their motion is. My deepest respects and Happy New Year. And I beg you not to withhold from me the results of your latest observations. From your Excellency's most affectionate servant, Mark Wellesley, Augsburg, January 6th, 1612. The rector at the University of Pisa delivered a book he thought would be of interest to you, but he asked that you not be disturbed, saying that every moment stolen from you is a moment stolen from Italy. What's it about? I don't know. Uh, De manulis in sole. About sunspots. 
Yet another. <laughs> Listen to the dedication to the greatest living authority on physics, Galileo Galilei. I read the treatise on sunspots which Fabritius had written in Holland. He thinks they are clusters of stars passing between the Earth and the Sun. Doubtful, don't you think, Mr. Galileo? In Paris and Prague, they think they are vapors from the Sun. Huh. Better as only doubts it. Oh, leave me out of it, would you? I said, hmm, that's all. I'm your lens grinder. I grind the lenses, and you make observations of the sky through them. And what you see is in spots, but maculis. How am I to doubt anything? How many times do I have to tell you I can't read the books? They're in Latin. And why don't you ask the monk? There's happiness in doubting. I wonder why. Every sunny day for the past two weeks, I've gone up to the attic under the roof. The narrow chinks between the shingles just let a thin ray of light through. If you take a sheet of paper, you can catch the sun's image upside down. I saw a spot as big as a fly, as smudged as a cloud. It was moving. Why aren't we investigating these spots, Mr. Galilei? Because we're working on floating bodies. You have a great basket full of letters. The whole of Europe wants to know what you think. You've such a reputation now. You can't just say nothing. Rome allowed me to get a reputation because I said nothing. But you can't afford to go on saying nothing now, nor can I afford to, go, to be roasted over a fire like a wood ham. Does that mean you think the sun spots are part of this earth round the sun business? You did sign a declaration in Rome saying you would have nothing more to do with that. Most worthy Mark Wells, your Excellency wrote me a most courteous letter three months ago, but I have been forced to silence by various circumstances. In particular, a long indisposition, or should I say a series of long indispositions, has made it impossible for me to write. And so it does, to a large extent still, though not so completely that I cannot reply to at least some letters from my friends and patrons, of which I find many awaiting answers. I have remained silent, also until I might hope to give some satisfaction to your inquiry about solar spots. The difficulty of this matter, combined with my inability to make continued observations, keeps my judgment in suspense. I, indeed, must be more cautious and circumspect than most other people in pronouncing upon anything new. As Your Excellency well knows, certain recent bodies that depart Certain recent discoveries that depart from my common popular opinion have been noisily denied and impugned, obliging me to hide in silence every new idea of mine until I have more than to prove it. Even the most trivial error is held against me in ca by capital fault by the enemies of innovation, making it seem better to remain in the herd in error than to stand alone in reasoning correctly. From Your Excellency's most diverted servitor, Galileo Galilei, May 4th, 1612. All right, let's stick to our floating bits of ice. At least they can't hurt you. Correct. Our proposition? As for floating, we assume that it depends not on a body's form, but on whether it is lighter or heavier than water. And what does Aristotle say? Viscus laticus perte. For God's sake, please translate it. A broad, flat piece of ice will float on water, whereas an iron needle will sink. And why does the ice not sink in Aristotle's view? Because it is broad and flat, and therefore cannot divide the water. Right. Now I'm pressing the ice hard against the bottom of the bucket. I release the pressure of my hands, and what happens? It shoots up to the top again. Right. Correct. Apparently it can divide the water all right as it rises. Now, Andrea, hand me the needle. What happens? The needle floats. <laughs> Holy Aristotle, they never checked up on it. <laughs> Mr. Galilei, you have a visitor arriving. Ah, uh, yes. Ludovico. How are the horses? Doing fine, sir. Sit down. Now, I'm told there are over a thousand students going to your lectures at the university. What are you working at just now? Routine stuff. Did you come through Rome? Yes. But, before I forget, my mother congratulates you on your remarkable tact in connection with these some spot orgies the Dutch have been going in for lately. Very kind of her. Mm. You know, I can tell you what all the gossip will be about in Rome this February. Christopher Clavius says he's afraid this whole Earth Round the Sun Act will start up again because of your sunspots. No chance. Any other news from the Holy City, aside 
from hopes of fresh lapses on my part? I suppose you know His Holiness is dying. <gasps> Who do you think is to see him? The favorite is Barberini. Barberini? Oh, Mr. Galileo knows Barberini. Cardinal Barberini is a mathematician. A mathematician for Pope? Well, so now they need a, a, a people like Barberini who have read a bit of, mat bit of mathematics. Things are beginning to move. That is only. We may see the day when we no longer have to look over our shoulders like criminals every time we want to say two and two equals four. Well, what do you have in mind? Oh, we're going to start up the Earth Around the Sun Act again. It's fixed, the scriptures say, and so orthodox science proves the Father grabs his ear to show it's firmly held, and yet it moves. Get out the brass reflector <laughs> and the screen. We will project the sun's image on it as to protect our eyes. That's your method. Okay, and now what of your declaration that you'll have nothing more to do with this business? <laughs> oh, that. In those days, we had a reactionary pope. Had? The oh. pope isn't even dead yet. Almost. Put a bit of squares on the screen. We will do this methodically. And then we will be able to answer the le their letters, won't we? Now, if His Holiness does die, Mr. Galilei, irrespective of who the next pope is and how intense his devotion to the science is, he will also have to take into account the devotion felt for him by the most respected families in the land. God made the physical world, Ludovico. God made the human brain, and God will permit physics. And the new pope will be an enlightened man. Bring the telescope. You will always be a slave to your passions. Let us embark on the examination of those spots on the sun which we were interested, at our own risk, without banking too much on the protection of a new pope. But fully convinced that we shall dispel those star shadow and sun vapor theories of Paris and Prague, and establish the rotation of the sun. Somewhat convinced that we shall establish the rotation of the sun. My objective is not to establish that I was right, but to find out if I am. Abandon all hope, I say, all ye who enter on observation. <laughs> they may be vapors, they may be spots, but before we assume they are spots, which is what would suit us best, we should assume that they are fried fish. <laughs> In fact, we shall question everything all over again, and we shall go forward not in seven-league boots, but at a snail's pace. And what we discover today, we shall wipe off the slate tomorrow, only to write it up again once we have discovered it again. And whatever we wish to find, we shall regard, once found, with particular mistrust. So we shall approach the observation of the sun with an irrevocable determination to establish that the earth does not move. Only when we have failed, have utterly and hopelessly been beaten, and are licking our wounds in the profoundest depression, shall we start asking ourselves if we weren't right after all, and that the earth does go round. But once every other hypothesis has crumbled in our hands, then there will be no mercy for those who failed to research and who will go on talking all the same. Now point the telescope at the sun. I've got to know. When shines the moon and heaven pass, its golden train, a tranquil arc, the sights of twinkling stars entrance. We marvel everywhere at sparks, discovered Galilei by thy glass, Jupiter's moons assentingly remark, and Saturn's entourage doth dance. But when dawn's light reveals new day, the sun alone spreads from the east, and shining beams enthrall our view. On scepter's glory, kings may feast adorned with gems while glints array. Satellites thus in multitudes proceed, companions follow favors due. That nothing can more blessed be than state of kingship all opine, who masks deceive with false displays what on the outside brilliant shines may not inside. Just as we see, who would believe? Black spots and sun divine? To Galilee's art sing praise. Truth, herald of salvation, unwelcomed flee the mighty. And often, an enemy proves more useful. Most illustrious sir and worshipful patron Mark Welser, some time ago I sent your worship a long letter concerning the solar spots and suggesting that in part the direction of my own thought at the time. Since then I have not strayed from that inclination, but am completely confirmed in it by continued daily observations. I repeat and more positively confirm to your excellency that the dark spots seen on the solar disks by means of my telescope are not at all distant from its surface, but are on the surface. Nor are they stars or other permanent bodies, but are always being produced and dissolved. They vary in darkness. 
And that part of the sky which deserves to be considered the most pure and serene of all, I mean, the very face of the sun, we have discovered these innumerable multitudes of dense, obscure, and foggy materials, and they will not. At the, and they will not end in a moment, but will endure through all future ages, allowing the humankind to observe at pleasure your illustrious excellency's very devoted servitor, Galileo Galilei, August 14, 1612. The sanctuary of the most holy trinity, free of all spots, she surrounded the eternal sun with her mortal flesh and was enfolded in its immeasurable light. She had this eternal sun around, above, and within her, and she was encircled by thousands of rays. The solar robe that covered her was white, brilliant, and glowing, and there was nothing dark about her, nothing obscure. There was no room for spiritual coldness in that heart, for it was all ablaze in the immense warmth of such a lovable and strong sun. Mary is clothed in the sun, imitating God, and lovingly conveying to us the warmth and light of his favor. The sun's slight alterations do not threaten the earth with total annihilation, nor do they constitute imperfections. Rather, they are her ornamentation, her glory. Why do they want to deprive heavenly bodies of such things? Why are they so fearful of the destruction of the universe through alterations that are no more harmful to the natural order than these things here on earth? The sun does not take part in the corruptions that occur under it. Its innocence is not changed by the sight of bad examples. The exhalations and vapors, the mud and the trash, do not dirty its purity. And whatever place it passes, whatever it touches, they cannot sully its light. The spots that astronomers have found in the sun are either an illusion of their sight or a mistake of their telescopes. Let astrologers reproach the sun for having spots that it does not have. Let them accuse it of sterilities of which it is innocent. Let poets make up stories of its love and its gallantries. Let them give it mistresses and bastards. Let others charge it with the birth of serpents and poisons. The sun will not distance itself for all that. It will not fail to shine on them. I suspect that our desire to measure everything with our limited human standards makes us take refuge in strange imaginings, and that our particular dread of death makes mutability hateful to us. But I do not believe that in order to become less changeable, we would really want to encounter the head of Medusa, so that she might turn us into marble or diamond, depriving us of our senses and of our other movements, freeing us from our changeability. sometimes made four. Mr. Galilei, I have been unable to sleep for three days. I couldn't see how to reconcile the holy decree I had read with what I had observed. Today I decided to say an early mass and come to you. In order to tell me that the sun has no spots? No. I have managed to see the wisdom of the decree. It has drawn my attention to the potential dangers for humanity in wholly unrestricted research, and I have decided to give astronomy up. But I also wanted to explain to you the motives that can make even an astronomer re renounce pursuing that doctrine any further. I can assure you, such motives are familiar to me. I understand your bitterness. You have in mind certain exceptional powers of enforcement at the church's disposal. Just call them instruments of torture. But I am referring to other motives. Let me speak of myself. My parents were peasants in the Campania, and I grew up there. They are simple people. They know all about olive trees, but not much else. As I study the faces of Venus, I can visualize my parents sitting around the fire with my sister eating their curded cheese. I see the beams above them, blackened by hundreds of years of smoke, and I can see every detail of their old worn hands and the little spoons they're holding. They are badly off, but even their misfortunes are in a certain order. 
There are so many cycles ranging from washing the floor through the seasons of the olive crop to the paying of taxes. There is a regularity about the disasters that befall them. They draw their strength that they need to carry their baskets, sweating up the stony tracks, to bear children and even to eat. From the feeling of stability and necessity that comes of looking at the soil, at the annual greening of the trees, and at the little church, and of listening to the Bible passages read there every Sunday. They have been assured that the whole drama of the world is constructed around them so that they, the performers, may prove themselves in greater or lesser roles. What would be the use of the Holy Scripture, which is explained and justified at all? The sweat, the patience, the hunger, the submissiveness, and now it turns out to be full of errors? If they thought that the only part anyone has devised for them is this wretched earthly one to be played out on a tiny star wholly dependent on others with nothing revolving around it, our poverty has no meaning. Hunger is no trial of strength that is merely not having eaten. Effort is no virtue, it's just bending and carrying. Can you now see why I read into the Holy Congregation's decree a noble, motherly compassion? A goodness of soul? Goodness of soul? Are you really saying that there is nothing for them? The wine has all been drunk, and their lips are parched, so they better kiss the cassock? Why is there nothing for them? Why does order in this country mean the orderliness of a bare cupboard, and necessity nothing but the need to work oneself to death? Why make the earth the center of the universe? So the church can be the center of the earth. That's what this is all about. You're right, it's not about the planets or the sun, it's about the peasants of the Campania. Am I supposed to tell your people lies? We have the highest of all motives for keeping our mouths shut. The peace of the mind of the less fortunate. Mr. Galilei, I am a priest. You're also a physicist. And you can see that Venus has phases and that there are spots on the rotating sun. But don't you think that the truth will get through without us so long as it's true? No, no, no. The only truth that gets through will be what we force through. The victory of reason will be no victory of people who are prepared to reason. Nothing else. Honored inhabitants, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce the great carnival procession of the guilds, we are going to perform the latest song from Florence, which is now being sung all over North Italy and has been imported by us at vast expense. <laughs> it is called Ye Horrible Doctrine and Opinions of Messer Galileo Galilei, Physicist to the Court, or a foretaste of your future. <clears throat> when the Almighty made the universe, he made the earth, and then he made the sun. Then around the earth he made the sun to turn. <laughs> That's in the Bible. That's in the Bible. Genesis chapter 1. And from that time all creatures here below were in obedient circles meant to go. So all the circles were all woven around the greater when the smaller around the pink center the crawler on earth as it is in heaven. Around the pope the cardinals, around the cardinals the bishops, around the bishops the secretaries, around the secretary the aldermen, around the aldermen the craftsmen, around the craftsmen the servants, around the servants the dogs, the chickens and the beggars. That good people is the great order of things. Ordo ordinarum, as the theologians call it. Regula eternus, the rule of rules. What? What, good people, happened? Up stood the learned Galileo, chucked away the Bible, and whipped out his telescope, took a quick look at the universe, and told the sun, stop there! Stop there! From now on, the whole creation day will turn as I think fair. The boss starts turning from today, his servants stand and stare. Now, now that's no joke, my friends. It is no matter small. Each day our servants' insolence increases. But one thing's true, pleasures are few. I ask you all, who wouldn't like to say and do just as he pleases? Honorable inhabitants, such doctrines are utterly impossible. The serf stays sitting on his arse. Mm. This turning's turned his head. The altar boy won't serve in mass. The apprentice lies in bed. No, 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 my friends. The Bible is no matter small. Once let them off the lead, indeed, all loyalty ceases. For one thing's true, pleasures are few. 
I ask you all, who wouldn't like to say and do just as he pleases? Good people all, kindly take a look at the future as foretold by the learned Dr. Galileo Galilei. Two housewives standing buying fish. Don't like the fish they're shown. The fishwife takes a hunk of bread and eats them up alone. The mason clears the building site and hauls the builder's stone. And when the house is finished quite, he keeps it as his own. Can such things be, my friends? It is no matter small, for independent spirit spreads like foul diseases. But one thing's true, pleasures are few. I ask you all, who wouldn't like to do just as one pleases? No, 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 no. Stop, Galileo, stop. Once you take a mad dog's muzzle off, it spreads diseases. People must keep their places, some down and some on top. Although it's nice for once to do just as one pleases. Honored inhabitants, you will now see Galileo Galilei's amazing discovery. The Earth circling around the sun. In my spare time, of which I have plenty, I have gone over my case and considered how it is going to be judged by that world of science which I no longer count myself a member. The pursuit of science seems to me to demand particular courage. It deals in the knowledge procured through doubt, creating knowledge for all, about all. It aims to turn all of us into doubters. As a young man in Siena, I watched a group of building workers argue for five minutes, then abandon a thousand-year-old <coughs> tradition of moving granite blocks in favor of a new and more efficient method. Then and there, I knew the old days are over and that this was a new time. The old idea was always that the stars were fixed to a crystal vault to stop them from falling down. Today, we have found the courage to let them soar through the space without support. And they are traveling at full speed, just like our ships, at full speed and without support. The heavens, it turns out, are empty. And the earth is rolling cheerfully around the spotted sun. And the fishwives, the merchants, the princes, the cardinals, and even the pope are rolling with it. The universe has lost its center overnight and woken up to find it has countless centers. So that each one can now be seen as the center, or none at all. Suddenly there is a lot of room. What does the poet say? Oh, early morning of beginnings, oh, breath of wind that cometh from new shores. Our ships sail far overseas. Planets move far out into space. Spots move across the surface of the sun. <laughs> 